participants are invited to submit questions by typing them into the questions feature on the GoToWebinar control panel. And throughout the session, the speakers will also invite you to participate in live polls using the GoToWebinar's polling feature. Thank you, Maura. Hello, I'm Ruth goodwin Groen, the Managing Director of the Better Than Cash Alliance, and I'd like to begin by welcoming all of you from around the world to our Cash to Digital Toolkit for governments and government agencies. Particular welcome to those of you who are in Asia and the Pacific. It's late in the evening for you. I'm really glad you're able to join us. And for those who are just waking up on the West Coast in the US, I uh, hope that you can, uh, we'll help you wake up this morning. So welcome to all of you. I'd also like to welcome our toolkit author, Beatrice Marilanda. We are thrilled that Beatrice uh, is the author of our toolkit because of her incredible depth of experience in helping governments transition to, from away from cash to digital payments. She has advised many government programs as well as financial institutions and multilateral bodies, including the World Bank, on issues of digitization and financial inclusion. And you'll want to know that Beatrice was at the forefront in Colombia seven years ago in 2007 on digitizing the government's uh, social cash transfer program into a financially inclusive savings account. So uh, Beatrice has been a leader in this field. Today she comes to us as a senior associate at Bankable Frontier Associates, uh, leading the work on uh, digitizing and, of course, has also been working on e-money legislation from a government perspective, so it brings a great depth of experience. Beatrice, welcome. Well, thank you, Ruth, for that introduction. I really would like to clarify that this toolkit is a result of a great team effort, and I really wish to thank my colleagues at BFA, members of the BTCA Knowledge Management Working Group, and the government officials who have tested it so far because they have been crucial in the development of this toolkit. Yes, indeed. Many of our members, uh, government officials, have been involved. And a huge thank you to all of you who are on the line and who've been participating in that. Thank you so much. For those of you who don't know us, the Better Than Cash Alliance is a global alliance of governments, private sector, and the development community who are all committed to moving away from cash to electronic or digital payments. We do three things. We advocate for the shift away from cash to digital payments with governments and the private sector and development partners. We develop cutting edge knowledge and research products, case studies, and of course toolkits, as well as providing technical support as appropriate. And it's, a, it's under our knowledge agenda that these toolkits come. And they were developed in response to demand from our members and others saying, where do we start? What are the right questions to ask? What do we need to consider? And so these toolkits have been developed in response to those questions. And they're going to be uh, a public good for our members and others to join. This one is for our friends in government and government agencies. Yesterday we were talking to development, the development community. Tomorrow we'll be looking at one for the business community, and then on Thursday and Friday, diagnostics for the whole ecosystem and measurement for the whole ecosystem. So today, now we can look at the agenda. We're going to, first of all, give you an overview of the government toolkit, and then I just want to highlight that this is not going to be a usual PowerPoint presentation with bullets like this all the way through. We're, this uh, toolkit is over 100 pages. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of text, but it's going to be web-enabled. And so you're going to be able to look at it on our website. So we're going to be giving you screenshots of what it's going to look like. It's not going to be the usual uh, PowerPoint presentation. And so just be ready for that when you see it. Also, you'll get a sense of what the overall approach is so that then when you get to the toolkit, you'll be able to go, in, go deeper on your own. Second and third, we're going to look at how to determine whether or not, whether you're ready or not to shift from cash to some form of digital, and then how to prioritize the payment streams for digitizing. 
And today we're going to look at tax collection because for many governments, tax collection is a key part of digitizing uh, the cash in the system. And so we thought that would be a really interesting uh, topic for the webinar today. Then we're going to go to a question and answer session. So as uh, Maura said at the beginning, you can see the question section on the right side of your screen, not the chat section, the question section. That will come straight to us, and we'll be able to uh, answer those in the last 15 minutes or so of the session. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll send you a link to the Yammer site, uh, which is a community of practice site where you'll be able to download a beta version of the toolkit and give us feedback on how to improve it over the next month. And then it will be uploaded on our new website in April, and so that you'll be able to actually work with it uh, online in, in April. So that you know, we are recording this and posting it on the website as well. So if you get called away for some urgent meeting, you can always come back and uh, find the rest of the webinar on our website uh, to catch up on what you missed. So that's what, where we're going this morning. But it'd be really interesting to see who's with us on the webinar today so that you all know. Then we're going to see if this poll uh, works. So. How many of you work in government agencies or are advisors to government agencies? And you can see here that we've got the options of government official, uh, consultant or advisor, uh, either multilateral or UN agency official, or if you are a participant in the ecosystem, our friends from the development community yesterday, or a financial service provider. And so if you could click on the one that's appropriate, we can see that everyone is clicking in now. That's great. And so we give you five more seconds, and then we'll close the poll. So five, four, three, two, one. Everybody's clicked in. Let's see what the uh, who's on the call today. Oh, terrific that we've got so many uh, advisors to government and government agencies. We are thrilled because this is you're going to be doing most of the work with with government agencies. So we're terrific. Whether uh, you're a consultant or working for a multilateral or a UN uh, agency. And I expect that many of the ones who are on uh, the 21% on ecosystem participants, as many of financial service providers who are also very interested. And usually on the other, I think we know from the registration, either um, academics or others. So we are, it's a great cross-section of participants. Um, so let's get started. Beatrice, this is the first screen that we see from the toolkit. Can you, there's a lot of text here, so can you walk us through it? Well, thank you, Ruth, for the introduction. As you can see, this is the first screenshot we, you were mentioning at the beginning uh, for the participants to understand. The toolkit is designed and worded so that those using it do not need previous knowledge on payments but want to learn more and identify the important issues they should take into account when considering to shift payments from cash to digital. The toolkit, it's important to know, understands digitization of payments as a journey that requires good planning, identification of allies and of risks, and it is a process demanding great effort and time to be implemented. That's why this toolkit follows the same methodology of the other stakeholder toolkits presented this week, as can be seen on the slide, with four basic sections that may be read in a continuum or reached directly, since the toolkit would be well mounted, as Ruth was mentioning, and you will be following it by clicking a specific tab, tab or name. So to respond to your question, Ruth, here on this slide, you're seeing the main sections of toolkit is divided in. These are First of all, the context and awareness, followed by the readiness and engagement, both of which pr provide you with a general picture of the why to shift and the initial considerations you should make to evaluate the options you have. The third section, the framing the case, suggests specific steps to follow when evaluating the shift applied to a specific payment stream. For example, in the case of government's tax collection. And finally, the fourth section 
called general resources, refers readers to other useful material as well as to the set of frequently asked questions. These four sections you will find and see in your screen in the first set of tabs in the following slides. The second set of tabs indicate a specific topic within one of the main sections, so in the web-mounted version the reader will be able to work through the different parts of the toolkit easily. What we really want to mention is that by the end of the toolkit we, you will be able to identify the steps needed to make an informed decision of how to replace cash payments and identify digital payment options that best suits your needs in the environment where you work. But it is also important to highlight, as you can see in bold at the bottom of the screen, the digital toolkit will help you assess option, but it is not an implementation manual. You will need to make a plan based on your recommendations to implement that decision. Uh, great. Thanks, uh, Beatrice. So what we're saying here is that obviously this is going to apply to government agencies around the world, and so their own, they will have to work out in their own context how to implement the, the, the questions and setting it all up. Will They'll have everything in front of them to be able to make that plan by the end of the, the toolkit. Right. Right, Ruth. And if you want, let's start with the context and awareness section so we illustrate that better. What you find here are examples of countries and references to resources and information on benefits and trends in government payments that are occurring worldwide. The content in this section underscores the role government can play in pushing the digital agenda for payments in each country, mainly in two areas. First of all, by shifting to its own payment streams. As many of you know, you can find a good example in the Mexico case study, which describes the journey of the National Treasury centralizing and digitizing supplier and salary payments in that country. Equally important can be the role played when issuing legislation fostering these types of payments. Here another example can be found in Columbia's case study, which describes the way the private ACH created an e-payment platform to facilitate Social Security contributions once government ordered that these should be filed and paid digitally uh, great. So those two case studies you just mentioned, Beatrice, are on our website for people who are interested. But let's go to uh, the, uh, the, actually click through to the con context and awareness section. And this is showing us the examples of trends on why, of the benefits of governments uh, transitioning away from cash. So tell us about that, Beatrice. Well, there are various trends that we identified, uh, many of them related to the government in general, many of them related to more local uh, institutions. But as we know, um, government actions have a much wider range of benefits than those perceived by private entities. So the section of major trends precisely refers to the different studies that identify various types of benefits. On this slide, we include references to one of them that is increasingly being mentioned, which is a close connection between formalization in the economies with the increased usage of digital payments. But we also include examples of cost efficiencies in activities undertaken by government agencies, as well as increased transparency and reduction of leakages as a result of increasing traceability of all payments. Obviously, the impact on economic development and growth that has been documented in different studies is also mentioned. And last but not least, the increased deepening of financial inclusion processes when using government payments to incorporate new clients to the financial system is also included. Great. So you can see there that this includes uh, referenced by some of our members in Philippines and Peru, and then there's a lot more uh, resources here showing why governments are uh, digitizing. So let's get started uh, on, the, on the readiness, how, how governments know that they're going to be ready, or government agencies know that they're going to be ready to uh, replace their cash. So what do we have here? Well, here we have 
um, the example of what the second session of the toolkit, the readiness and engagement, um, suggests. And it includes the stages that should be followed to help them uh, decide how to prioritize payment streams and where and how to focus your efforts. This journey, first of all, suggests to identify the drivers behind your interest. Second of all, it suggests a focus in the scope of the effort in terms of the types and the volume of payments to be shifted. Thirdly, it suggests that one needs to take into account the market environment as well as the internal readiness of a specific agency, which we have, have called the context stage. And the fourth stage, which will help you prioritize and decide if it is worthwhile to continue further in this analysis. I would like now, uh, Ruth, to give an example of an exercise that we use to help government understand better the implication of a different landscape that one can encounter in the national payment system of emerging economies. Great. We love example. Okay. Um, this slide shows a summary table we used after we have introduced a few concepts describing the basic characteristics on payment system to help the reader identify what are the typical payment streams that can be most readily shifted according to the specific development of the payment system in, in each context. In this slide, for example, we highlight the, the, how salary payments may be easier to shift in a country where the development of the national payment system is in an early stage, as indicated by the first column on, on the graph. While taxes need a more robust and sophisticated infrastructure to be able to collect them electronically typical of what we call a mature payment system in the last column. This is just one of the examples of elements that we suggest in the toolkit you can use to help assess the readiness to shift, either at the government level or for a specific agency. So, uh, Beatrice, you mentioned the Mexico case study before, and in that one, the, the, our, our friends in Mexico spent a lot of time organizing their own payment infrastructure in the establishment of a IFMIS, an integrated financial management system, and the Treasury single account. And for those of our friends who work in public financial management and others, that's a really key part of it. Could you tell us a bit more how that relates to what you're doing? Well, Ruth, let me um, show you the next slide. And, um, this, as you, as you emphasize, is a critical element in this process at a government level. So the toolkit uh, ref refers to this element, suggesting how this can be a process of understanding your internal readiness. Nevertheless, um, and because of it, we were able to take advantage of the rich information and research regarding government payments provided and published by different agencies on these topics. So what we did was instead of replicating or, or duplicating it, what we did was build upon it, dedicating efforts instead to complement other aspects directly related to electronic payments. And what we did can be seen on this slide with the topic of the integrated financial management system as well as the single treasury account are presented in a very schematic way directing readers to specific resources and documents published for example by World Bank, IMF, USAID and IADV so that those interested can conduct further research with those specialized resources. Yes, I noticed here that the source is adapted from our friend Carlos Pimenta at the Inter-American Development Bank and you've got links through to our friends at the payments team at the World Bank and of course our friends at the IMF Public Financial Management Team, uh, their resources. Uh, so there's a lot of great, really, really robust, substantive work that we're, that we, that we just point people to uh, because this is for people who are starting out and for those who are specialists 
there's a there's an incredible depth of experience there. So thank you to all of our um, colleagues who uh, have done such tremendous work uh, on this uh, issue of uh, isthmus and uh, TSAs. So we have those resources. So let's get to the real core of the uh, toolkit, uh, Beatrice. This uh, framing the case. Okay, the third section of the toolkit, Ruth, reflects the methodology we suggest in the toolkit to help you and the, and the readers and the participants today determine the possibility to shift a specific payment stream. This um, section is structured so you can tackle one payment stream at a time, each of which will involve different stakeholders, alternative payment options, all of which need to be considered in an organized uh, manner. The use of a specific payment stream also allows us to address the concerns of a diverse set of agencies that make up government in general, from national treasuries to the social department and even to municipalities wishing to shift its own payments. The payment streams included in this toolkit first are the cash transfer module which was presented yesterday and which we think have, have a lot of similarities but in the government toolkit we referred specifically to governments wishing to, to shift uh, it's cash transfer payments. The second module is the one we're going to see in more detail in a few minutes. And these refer to the tax collection. And in a few months you will be seeing um, the modules on salary and supplier payments, which we hope to enhance uh, and make it uh, even a better complement the better way the toolkit. Great. So the for those of you who were participating yesterday, we went through the cash transfer uh, steps. And so the we're going to go through the tax collection one today, which is really cool for those of you who are uh, involved in this. There's, there's uh, tremendous uh, opportunities here. So I'd like to do another poll since we've got our polls working. So for the country you work in or advise, when did that country start digitizing national income tax filing and payments? So has it not started? Is it less than two years ago? Is it in the past two to five years? Or is it more than five years ago? Or maybe you don't know. And it'll be really interesting to see where you come out on this because there's some fascinating data that, that Beatrice has to share with us uh, once the poll closed. So uh, let's give us five more seconds to, uh, and we don't know who's voting where, so it doesn't matter if you put I don't know. So uh, I can see some people are still voting. So we'll give it five more seconds, four, three, two, one, and so let's close the poll and see where everybody's at. And oh, Beatrice, this is what you expected, uh, isn't it? You thought that the majority of people would be, I don't know. So why did you think that most people would be, I don't know? Well, Ruth, it's amazing, and, I, and we did anticipate this as we were talking the few days beforehand. Um, what we found in our interviews to the tax authorities is that they are undertaking immense efforts to shift to platforms that enable e-filing and e-payment of taxes. But once they do so, apparently they have various difficulties communicating and making uh, taxpayers understand the benefits um, and how they can facilitate tax, tax compliance. So what you find and what tax authorities report is that many of the taxpayers still don't know that they have already implemented these types of platforms and these types of alternatives, but the taxpayers still maintain their traditional payment styles, like paying by check and going to a bank branch. So this is clearly a good reflection of what uh, tax authorities are perceiving. 
So, uh, Beatrice, this is also connected to what you were saying before in terms of one of the motivations for a government's digitizing is the connection to, uh, to formalization. So given that where everyone's at, let's go back to the uh, framing the case. OK, and I would like to start there um, just giving you some of the information you were mentioning, Ruth, about um, the data we collected. And here, and related precisely to the poll question we just had, interestingly, we were able to establish that according to the World Bank paying the taxes surveys. 76 economies of the 189 surveyed in 2012 had already fully implemented digital filing and payment of taxes in the previous eight years. And when you go into the toolkit, you'll find that is not a characteristic really only of developed countries. It is increasingly a phenomenon taking um, place in developing countries. So um, these specific major worldwide trends are just some of the examples which are the essence of the introduction to this module on tax collection. And again, following the same methodology, methodology applied for all the stakeholder to toolkits, after a brief introduction, what the toolkit does is identifies the main steps a government agency should take to frame a wise decision around the way the when and the why to shift a specific payment stream. So um, the toolkit takes the reader through four steps, which we think should follow in order they should follow any any person wishing any, any government official wishing to undertake this journey should follow in order to recommend any sort of action. These steps can be seen right on the screen on the screen showing and they are, first of all, understand and determine the drivers really behind your interest. Second of all, identify the stakeholders you need to take into account to make this a, su a successful shift. Third of all, investigate the options the market you're in offers, but also understand uh, the options and also the limitations you will find. Fourthly, calculate the costs and compare the different options because typically you will not be only confronted with one alternative. You will have many and you need to understand what the options uh, imply in terms of costs. And finally, assess risks. All of these should make it possible at the end of this section for you to identify the main components of what should be your recommendation. Great. Well, let's start with drivers then. And I, we have a poll question about that too. So for those of you who are on the, the webinar, in your own context, what do you think are the major drivers towards digitizing taxes? Do you think it's to reduce the cost? for the tax collection agency? Do you think it's uh, to minimize the time and cost for the taxpayer? Do you think it's to minimize tax leakage? Or do you think it's to promote financial inclusion in your own uh, context? So it's, it's really interesting. Is the concern for the agency, for the taxpayer, or for the broader government goal of, of promoting financial inclusion? Now, the we can see people voting here. So if you could, those who've not, if you can click on what you think is uh, the, the major trend for the digitizing of taxes. We know what our members think. So let's see what everyone, I think we've got everybody voted in now. So what's the result of the poll? Uh, minimizing tax leakage is the number one priority. Now, why is that not a surprise? That's really interesting. But then, actually, Beatrice, the 30% on promoting financial inclusion is fascinating. That's uh, a bit higher than we expected, didn't we? And, uh, and the lowest is reducing costs for the tax collection agency. Um, so how do these compare with what uh, you found in your experience of working with governments, Beatrice? Well, although financial inclusion is a driver behind many of the government initiatives, when you consider tax collection, 
really financial inclusion, I would say, is a prerequisite and related, as you were saying, Ruth, with more with formalization of the economy. But this survey does highlight the two main um, factors that we identify tax authorities are looking after when thinking of digitizing. Uh, and that is precisely to facilitate tax compliance by reducing the transaction cost for taxpayers. And um, that's why also they do not understand when they do so. Why is it that taxpayers don't use it, which is interesting. But second of all, um, they also mention the importance to minimize leakages and reduce corruption. And many of, in their interviews were mentioning how digital platforms uh, kind of eliminate the need for personal um, contact between um, government official or tax collector, tax collector and the taxpayers. And that's a side result which uh, were mentioned. Um, but nevertheless, it is important and uh, many of the tax authorities do understand that in the process they can um, have a reduction of costs. But these are clearly identified when an increase, as they, many of them mentioned, when the process enables receiving tax files and paying taxes digitally. Which for us it was very interesting to find that, that for many of these authorities, electronic filing and electronic payments are a distinct process, but mutually reinforcing. So really we should have had an E for all of the above. But what I'm hearing you saying then, Beatrice, is that uh, B and C, which is the tax leakage and the minimizing the time and cost for the taxpayer, when you talk to the tax authorities, that's the ones that in your experience have been the highest. But of course, the larger government priority is, uh, is financial inclusion and uh, in including people in the formal sector. So it's really interesting to see how they are all mutually reinforcing. So um, great. Uh, great results from this poll. Thank you so much for participating, everybody. So um, let's go on to the, this investigating your options when you're looking at shifting tax collection, um, Beatrice. There's an arrow here. So what's that pointing to? OK, um, maybe a step back, Ruth, because it's important uh, that we are not now mentioning step two, which is what we suggested as the t stakeholder analysis. But that's because we think for tax collection it is evident for all our, our participants what this would uh, include. So we go to step three. And what uh, this slide illustrates is the way we think you should go about analyzing your options. The first thing you should be looking at is what are the specific uh, options in terms of number and types of instruments that you can find in the market and understand if and when taxpayers can access them. The second element we think is important to understand your options is to understand the legal framework in which you're moving. In the case of taxes, um, we found all the time um, a lot of uh, an important mention of how electronic signature and the whole legal structure of electronic signatures uh, are a crucial aspect because um, these are needed when thinking of electronic filing since electronic filing has various legal consequences in any of our countries. The other legal aspect, um, for example, that, w that came up when discussing with tax authorities was if, to understand if, they're, if they have the legal authorization to um, delegate to third parties tax collection. Because when you think about digitizing tax collection, you always think about going to the payment system, going to the banks. And what we found is that that 
is kind of a, um, a prevalent fact in the Latin American countries. But for example, it is less common in the Asian and the African countries where the possibility of collecting taxes still is not permitted. So you need to understand that. But then the analysis should include also identifying payment providers and evaluating if they're able to serve your purposes or if it would be possible and necessary to consider different options. In the case of tax collection, for example, and related to e-filing, we found there are many companies, not related even to financial providers, that are uh, providing these um, electronic platforms to connect the tax authority with the tax uh, payers. So it's important to understand all these options and uh, based on that, um, evaluate which are the best alternatives in your case. Yes, and of course there are also great resources on all of this from our friends at uh, the IMF, the World Bank, the different regional development banks uh, that work on these issues. And so this is helping you figure out when and where to, to use the, that information that's available. So um, there's the investigating these options is can take quite a bit of time to, to figure out. So Beatrice, then the next step. What, what once you've investigated all your options, what comes next? Step four, Ruth, is one related to estimating the cost structure. And what we have found is that this is clearly one of the most difficult ones that tax authorities have because it is difficult for them to understand and identify and quantify their current cost structure. So they therefore cannot evaluate um, and compare their, today, their, their cost structure today and compare it with different options that are offered when digitizing these collections. So what we did was include a series of exercises to help them at least identify the different components by disaggregating the types of channel being used, as you can see on the table included in your screen right now. And based on that, compare them to possible options available in the market. So Beatrice, just let me pause there one minute. So what you're saying is that there are like blank uh, cells in this screen here and that uh, when you can either click on you'd like to see an example of doing this or you have uh, a costing uh, option for people to look at to be able to assess those costs, right? So, as, as this table and many of the tables that are included in the toolkit, these are downloadable uh, work files where you can um, include the, um, the information that we're suggesting you should compile and organize in these sheets to facilitate your exercise. And I'll, 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 I'll tell you in a minute how we make these, uh, all these tables we put in come together into an understandable exercise. But I would okay. like to uh, mention an additional thing, uh, Ruth, related to cost structure. And that um, another a uh, difficulty we found for tax authorities that when they have already outsourced their tax collection, for example to banks, many of them have difficulty recognizing the costs involved in this since it's very common to find that they do not pay through a commission but instead they leave resources idle for a few days at the banks as a compensation. So the opportunity cost this entails is not easily quantifiable. So again, for that purpose, we have a specific example in one of the tables included in the toolkit so they can try to establish the, the opportunity cost they are incurring with that type of arrangement. 
Yeah, that would be important to, to figure out, wouldn't it, if you were in this uh, in this process. And you said, Beatrice, that there was uh, you wanted to be able to put all these different pieces together in an example to to show us. Would it, could we go to that now? Would that be useful? Yes, Ruth. Um, after we do all this exercise, and we just suggest all readers to undertake um, the exercises. The way we thought was easier for everybody to understand and to help um, government authorities and consultants to uh, go through this exercises was to include at the end of each payment module, in this case at the end of the tax collection module, um, to compile them and present them as the case of a, um, an entity. In this case what we, what we call the Bureau of Internal Revenue of Ecosystemia a country which reflects a composite profile on, of data and experiences of a typical entity in lower income middle and sorry in uh, lower and middle income countries facing the decision on where and if so how to digitize its payments so in this section of the toolkit we put all those exercises together and we actually include examples with numbers and with um, uh, data reflecting our experience on the typical findings they are going to find it, they're going to use in these types of exercises fascinating so uh, we're all looking forward to, to going through that case and and there's just one point I just want to add when we're looking through these different cases Beatrice that many of the uh, we're based at the United Nations here and one of the things that are coming up this year is of course the the post-2015 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, but and one of in preparation for that, there's going to be a big meeting on domestic resource mobilization, and many of our member countries are looking at tax, uh, improving their tax collection as a domestic resource mobilization um, point. That we didn't, we didn't. Uh, we forgot to mention that when we were talking about drivers. And so having these kind of examples help people think about what are the costs and what are the benefits and, and how to actually address that issue of uh, a domestic resource mobilization. So it'll be great to, to work through these examples to see that. So um, this is the example of going through all the different steps. But I'm sure there are lots of questions that, that people have. And in the toolkit, you have a, a frequently asked questions section, don't you? Yes. These are included in the last section of the toolkit, the one we call general resources. Here, um, we have right now 12 frequently asked questions. Uh, a set of, of, of six of them are showing on your screen. And we will really uh, want to refine and complement these uh, with the help of users and testers like folks on this webinar, uh, which we would really like to provide us with input and feedback. Um, all the questions I think that you've been, I've been seeing, you've been posting on, on, the, um, on the question format are going to be very useful for us to understand better what types of additional questions you have and how uh, we can help you in the toolkit to resolve them or at least find alternative res resources where to look for it. Yes, exactly. The, the, there's some, been great questions coming in as we've been talking. So, and I just want to underline that point that you had made, Beatrice, is that this is a beta version of the toolkit, and so when it's downloaded, if there are questions that people have that don't um, come up either in the FAQs or in the process of going through the other modules, such as on the cash transfers, then we can uh, we can improve the toolkit so that when it's web enabled, we have those uh, uh, aspects all covered. I think there's, there's a great we have uh, time to go through the next poll that we had. Uh, had as an option here, poll number four, because it would be really interesting to know uh, what best reflects your most burning question. Uh, we've gone through one particular module here, but there are other modules in the toolkit, and so there are 
three that we've listed here, but you may have another. And so if you could put that into the, uh, the question section if you've not already done. So some of the questions that Beatrice has got is, of course, of looking at the cost and benefits. Is that your question? Understanding cost and benefits of shifting particular payment streams. Second, how do I know if there's uh, appropriate payment infrastructure, or how do I assess the payment infrastructure? A third question is, given low levels of financial inclusion, which is uh, the case in many of the countries and member countries of the alliance with whom we work, uh, which of the payment streams uh, to be shifted first. So if you could vote on which are your most burning questions, I'll uh, get Be Beatrice to um, comment on those uh, before we go to the more general questions. So we've got another five, and I can see people writing in some other questions as well. So uh, five, four, three, two, one. So let's close the poll and see where your most burning questions are. Half of the participants on our webinar, Beatrice, are the third question is their highest priority. Thinking about low levels of financial inclusion, what are the priority payment streams for government uh, to digitize? So would you like to take that question? Well, Ruth, um, this is clearly uh, a concern we always face when talking to government officials. And obviously um, the countries that uh, most of us are working in are characterized by low levels of financial inclusion. So here um, the question obviously reflects here the way is where do I start? If I have low financial inclusion do I just don't do anything or can I go ahead? And here the benefit of um, thinking as government official is going back to my first um, message in that what we do in the toolkit is emphasize the role governments can play. It's not a it's not a typical business. The government can play a, a great role. For example, related to moving the agenda in financial inclusion. First of all, a typical example is working with your cash transfer programs. That's an important element in any uh, financial inclusion strategy. So thinking how to best digitize those payments is clearly uh, an important element which will help financial inclusion in the country. Um, the other is salary payments. Salary payments in a lot of countries are still being done in cash or in check. So giving the example, and we saw that in the Mexico case, for example, we have been mentioning, but we see it all over the world. Governments moving its salary payments have been able to drive and the force of financial inclusion just by yeah, using that power it has. And finally, um, thinking on how to um, include in your financial inclusion agenda thoughts related to digitizing, which is crucial and every day we understand that better, that if we still maintain cash, financial inclusion is going to be very, very difficult and very costly. Yes, it's, uh, it's fascinating that there's often not the connection between those who are actually managing salary payments and those who are concerned about financial inclusion when we were at uh, the Fotogel meeting of Latin American treasurers and had uh, some of our members on the panel who came from the treasuries, they ended up being the heroes of financial inclusion because they were making the salary payments into uh, financially inclusive accounts. And so the teachers and the government workers who were getting those were then uh, included in the uh, uh, financial sector and that could save and, and have all the other benefits associated with that. And so making that connection between the opportunities on digitizing salary payments uh, to increase financial inclusion is a, is a huge opportunity. And uh, that's also for the financial service providers, they're able to see that this is a, a, a big win for them too, as well as for the government and for the uh, clients or uh, the receivers of those payments, payments. And then of course the cash transfers you mentioned is, uh, is a huge opportunity and then uh, as well, but it often has to be associated with uh, uh, 
a larger financial inclusion program so that it's not uh, just on its own, it's, it's part of that, uh, of a bigger strategy. And so there are uh, great opportunities in digitizing payments to uh, progress the financial inclusion agenda, which has uh, great benefits not only for uh, the government in terms of driving uh, formalization and growth, but also for all those who are receiving it as well. So um, no wonder we've got that as the top question for our uh, for those who are interested who are participating in this webinar. And then the second uh, question that people had was on the uh, a payment infrastructure. So would you like to um, take that question, the lack of infrastructure challenge? Well, Ruth, <coughs> that's a tricky question, and that's why we. Um, dedicate so much effort in the toolkit, uh, both in the general two initial sections as well as in the framing the case and applied specifically to a payment stream to understand the importance of the payment infrastructure so that government officials do not initiate a, a shift if the adequate payment infrastructure is not there. So the, way, the best way we thought to address these questions was to exemplify and to take the reader through the process of evaluating, understanding, and looking at different options. And we have references to international experience and to the questions, for example, you should be making to your banking association and to the bankers to uh, understand how ready they are. And also it depends on the payment stream you're talking about. Because if you're talking, for example, about cash transfers, an issue regarding interoperability, which sounds as a very sophisticated world, but we understand is just the ability to exchange payments within the payment system and within the financial institutions, well, that issue is crucial when considering tax collection but it's not so relevant when you're disbursing cash transfers through, for example, uh, savings account. So we address this question referring the readers to the different sections in the toolkit which uh, look into the payment infrastructure and address this issue. And also we refer readers to different sources where they can go uh, and, and acquire better knowledge of different payment systems uh, opportunities within the toolkit. Great. I see that there are quite a few questions coming in about examples uh, and uh, of, of different types of approaches, and uh, there will be sources for different uh, examples, right, Beatrice? Right, right. There are many uh, sources referred to with, throughout the toolkit. And that's what we wanted to be a reference point uh, for people to look upon and then be able to go further, do further research in, in those sources that are specialized in certain topics. Great. And then uh, some of the other questions have been about uh, resources to help with this process. Um, and uh, the the Yammer site that we're going to be giving the, the emailing everybody, it's, it's a social networking site, but it's, it's only for those who are working on this toolkit. And so there will be an opportunity to ask you and our friends uh, uh, in the government members as well as uh, our uh, knowledge uh, uh, consultants and teams here at the Better Than Cash Alliance to be able to engage and ask questions as we develop the toolkit and say, well, this isn't clear enough. How do we do more of that? So that so there will be opportunities in the next month to, to improve things if uh, all the questions have not been answered. So just to, uh, we're coming, we're, there's a quick final question here that comes from our uh, colleagues at UNCDF who also work on local development as well as uh, financial inclusion is what about, the, what is the difference between shifting government payments at a national versus a local level? Can you just take that quickly? 
Well, Ruth, thanks a lot for that question because it is different. And what we found is that, um, well, let me answer that question like in, in two big parts. Um, the first is a concern because what we saw is that at a local level, the benefits of digitization might not are not so clear and not um, uh, so readily identified. So um, that's why we put so much emphasis in um, including these sections on, on the benefits of digitization. But if you think if you think about it at local level, it can be easier to digitize because um, first of all, the coordination effort, which at the national level is gigantic, at the local level can be simpler. Obviously, because of the same issue, the stake, uh, the number of stakeholders you need to coordinate is quite re is smaller, and also. Interestingly, what we found is that alternative models in terms of, for example, of payment instruments might be easier to pilot just at a local level because of a smaller size involved and, but, and that's because in some cases you also can do a leapfrog. Uh, and let me give you an example. For example, with taxes. At the local level, you normally collect taxes referred to property or to uh, auto taxes or vehicle taxes. The value of these taxes can be predetermined using third-party sources like property registries or tables on values of vehicles. This facilitates pre-filled forms and the sending of these pre-filled forms to taxpayers, which can be sent beforehand so you do not need an e-filing um, platform, which is quite complex. But you can just enable payment options. And here, for example, we use the example of the Philippines where precisely using this option, uh, which is offered when talking about property taxes and vehicle taxes, they're also thinking about and implementing pilots based with or financed with a USAID project using mobile phones to pay for these taxes. So it, it's, it's simpler. And we need just to convince local participants and local entities that they gain a lot from this shift. So there are real opportunities at the local level uh, with examples in the toolkit. Uh, fascinating. Beatrice, we're coming to the end of our time here. So uh, there are lots more questions uh, come, coming in. And so I just want to encourage you all to when you get, it says following the webinar, you'll receive a link to join the Toolkit Community Forum on Yammer. And so please share your stories with us. You know, if you think that there's a great case in uh, the country that you're working in, please uh, add those in or give us an, another resource and uh, we'll recognize your, your input because that's one of the benefits of being an alliance is that we include lots of both uh, governments as well as those who work in companies and the development community. And for those of you who were in the development community uh, discussion yesterday, I think that the Yammer site is going out this morning together with the government one. Uh, so they're going out together so you can join that. And uh, as we said, it will let you download a beta version of the toolkit to be part of the uh, process of it getting better. And then we will be able to do a formal launch uh, in April with our new website. So with that in the last minute, I would like to thank you all for participating, for being such, uh, for your great questions, for your participation in the polls, and for joining us this morning, morning in uh, East Coast, uh, New York time anyway, wherever you are in the world. And to thank you, Beatrice, for your uh, contribution of all your great experience to this. Every time you talk, I can hear you clicking through all the different examples in your head that you've worked and there's so much more that could be said. And so we look forward to engaging with you uh, in the, uh, the Yammer site to asking to really uh, both using the toolkit and getting your experience on this. So thank you very much to you and to everybody this morning. Have a great day or evening wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much.